Welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from four varied countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alessio. Hello. Audrey. Hi, hi. And Cara. Hey. And I am your host for this episode, Fen. And today we're going to be talking about Love Letter, Tokaido Duel, uh, the legacy campaigns for Aeon's End, and Astro Knights. But first we'll start with the good old Standy catch-up, and uh, Alessio, how things been? Oh, well, uh, pretty good, actually. Uh, I have been doing exactly one thing in the uh, last couple of weeks, uh, which is uh, I am unpacking Frost Heaven. <laughs> I, I received the game, so finally received the game, actually, I have to say. And uh, I am unpacking stuff, uh, and, uh, well... It's a lot of stuff, and uh, I didn't buy an insert, mostly on principle, because uh, uh, it's a bit lazy to to just make a game uh, you know you won't be able to put back. So I'm trying to figure it out. I I think I just brought this uh, up on myself, so (laughs) I'm, I'm I'm trying to work this out. Uh, I think uh, it will take another week, uh, including uh, busy with other games and actual work, uh, before I'll be able to put this to the table. Hopefully, it will it will be worth it. Anyway, that's basically my boring two weeks. So, mm. what about what about uh, <laughs> anyone else? I think. <laughs> well, I, I got to say before we do flip it to someone else. Uh, yeah. Trying to pl- get, play any of those Haven games without a, a third-party insert is just asking for trouble. Yeah. The best third-party insert is Steam, and that's how I've actually ended up enjoying Gloomhaven. <laughs> you, um, you, you know, this is, you are right. You are yeah, right. This is actually how I did. I got it. I think for free on uh, on the other platform, which is not Steam. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, basically, th- that's uh, a pretty enjoyable way to play Gloomhaven. However, I have to say that the mechanic uh, now that there's Outsworn, which is another card game, but the mechanic is a bit more dynamic. Uh, uh, I know there are roles, so it's not exactly the same target. Uh, but it beca- it begins to feel old, so possibly uh, I hope that Frost Heaven brings up uh, a bit more to the table without bringing way too more to the table. <laughs> That's basically it for now. So uh, I I probably be able to comment in a very long time. So what about you, Audrey? Uh, well, on, on the game gaming side, to be honest, uh, re- really not not much. Uh, still Marvel snaps. Uh, but my, my main uh, topic is that I am currently recovering from um, eye surgery that I did uh, less than 24 hours ago, uh, so that I can stop wearing glasses until I'm 45, 47. I I don't know exactly. Uh, so I am currently uh, in a black room, pitch black. Uh, not not exactly pitch black, but wearing my sunglasses on top of it, uh, <laughs> and uh, having help from my husband to set up the recording and things. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to get much in terms of games for the next few days um we are hoping that we can play some uh not very text heavy games uh after two days of recovery like we're thinking takenoko for instance azul uh etc that should be uh convenient for my recovery so that i don't get bored because i'm already bored and it's been less <laughs> than 24 hours <laughs> so um, yeah, let, let me tell you that the first three hours were th- okay, and then there was uh, a bit of a rough patch for five, six hours during the night, uh, but uh, I'm already seeing the the path to feeling better, uh, so now it's going to be the path to my eyes getting adjusted to it and the blurriness uh, fading out, so yeah, really, n- that's all I have to say today, I think. 
But yeah, I, I, I hope this is going to be worth it. Uh, Kira, what's new about you? Um, well, what's new? Um, I restarted my streams last week. So after half a year of hiatus, hiatus, hiatus. Oh God, how do you spell How do you Pause. pronounce it? <laughs> it's it's like this. Hiatus! <laughs> hiatus. So yeah, after that, I finally um, did a stream again. It was it was a lot of fun. I uh, continued uh, painting my clone troopers um, according to oh yes, I, I saw them. yeah according to how Audrey taught me uh, last year. Uh -huh. And um, so yeah, I have one squad finished now, and I'm really happy with that. And I'm looking forward to another stream where I paint the second squad. <clears throat> So, um, yeah, um, apart from that, I actually haven't gotten around to playing a lot um, because of life and stuff. Um, yeah, I'm watching Buffy. Um, the, Buffy uh, the Vampire Slayer? Yeah. Um, the, the one from that Joss Whedon, that guy? Yeah. Uh, is, is it because right now, uh, is it because the last few weeks everyone was raving about uh, P uh, Pedro Fernandez's appearance back then? N no, it? it's, um, I mean, I, <laughs> I kind of, you know, I, I was looking for w w what TV show I could watch. And um, then I saw in Disney Plus like Buffy and I thought, hey, that's a show I have heard people talking about in the past at some point. So a lot of time passed, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of didn't realize how long ago this was, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's growing on me. I, it started out really weird, but uh, yeah, it it grew on me, and uh, so I, I'm hooked. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, um, what about you, fan? Well, uh, I'm gonna refrain from commenting on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, I'm not particularly much a fan of the creator of the show anymore, uh, but it was very groundbreaking for its time. Uh, so, hip, uh, my final girl arrived. Um, I learnt that the mystery box for series two is not automatically included in the, uh, like, everything from season two pledge series two, which was like... Oh, okay, and they only give it out specifically within Kickstarter campaigns. Um, the book's also very firmly said, we're going to be doing a Series 3, so uh, it should be interesting. Um, I've never seen such a wasteful Kickstarter. Uh, it's So, like, the actual products themselves are pretty compact. But they do the series boxes, which are nice. But if you like the second series box arrived with everything packed in it. And I was like, this is fine. This is absolutely fine. Um, the first series box, though, arrives. Uh, you open it up and it has a box for the cast and crew and the bonus features, which is like cast and crews, all the like final girls and um, the birds uh, based extra campaign. Uh, and... Um, uh, then the remaining space is filled by this gigantic polystyrene block. Absolutely, like, huge. Huge block. Maybe 20 centimetres squared or something like that. Oof. Just, I, I, I was like, well, if I ever decide to play uh, Necromunda or Mordheim again, I should probably keep this so I can carve it into being, like, a piece of terrain because throwing it out feels really irresponsible considering it's just a walking crime against nature. But... What I found even more like mind-boggling is I bought the Series 1 mats because I was like, okay, at the I know the Series 1 box is arriving. It's going to have a, a box at the top. It looks like a VHS player. Um, and, and you put the mats in there. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll get that. That box of mats, that those mats arrive in a VHS box. Exactly the same box that sits at the top of Series 1. So I was like, great, so you've sent me... A duplicate box of the box I already have that you knew you were sending to me. So I have, now have this sealed empty box that I haven't thrown out yet because I might find some stuff to store in it. I might store the extra like zombie and bird miniatures. But uh, and and to add to all of that, I myself 
um, misread what I was getting and bought a second copy of the Series 1 box. So I have two of those polystyrene cubes. I've not opened the other box at all, but uh, I, I might like put it on Board Game Geek's marketplace for like the amount it costs me to see if somebody, um, you know, wants it or not. But shipping shipping's expensive. You suggest? I suggest turning one of those polystyrene blocks into a dinosaur statue so you get back to it. Hmm, it's a bit, it's a bit much. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but I mean, I, I would say like the second series is pretty cool. The references they've done like Alien, The Thing, um, uh, the, the, the Home Invasion, you know, like Your Next slash The Strangers, uh, Red Riding Hood for some reason, and then Silent Hill. So, and the and classic Boring Zombies. Oh, I know. love Silent Hill. The yeah. The one, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they've done the whole. It's, I think it's more based on the second one. It's it's more asylum themed, um, so obviously it's going to have its old classic trope problems with madness and the way madness is treated in games. But that's not uh, that's endemic across gaming. Anyway, so final girl. Oh, and uh, uh, the season one mystery box and spoilers. If you want to know, this is it here. It's a cardboard box. You open up. It's got a gigantic plastic Necronomicon. Uh, which is completely solid plastic apart from two small areas hollowed out where you put two dice. It is the biggest waste of plastic I've ever seen. It's also the only waste of plastic I've ever seen that I'm like, you know what, I'm, I'm okay with this one. This one's kind of, <laughs> kind of neat. Uh, but it doesn't fit in any of the boxes, so I, I, if I, like I'm taking all of this to Stockholm with me next week. Um, to play it while over there. Uh, so we'll be staying at um, the in-laws um, flat in the middle of Stockholm. Um, so we need something to be able to play in the evenings. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm not bringing that over. It's too much extra. But it, I, I just wish it could have fit inside the VHS box or something, but it doesn't. Anyway, so yeah, Final Girl. Um, it's a good game. Uh, I don't know how good the Series 2 videos are. I may talk about it in the future. That's been the vast majority of what I've been doing beyond um, I got the fancy but functional ATO insert, which I talked about previously, and I've been playing it on the table, and it's been fantastic. So that's it. Um, and uh, that takes us on to time to write a short and secretive letter to those who matter. Audrey, tell us about Love Letter. Yes, love letter. So I have uh, a little, let's say, angel on my shoulder to help me with the creators. What? Sorry, I, f I feel like I messed up. <laughs> you clock at the yes. <laughs> yes. I had one job. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just not trust Kara to deliver any letters. She'd probably be like, oh, a love letter, I deliver it straight to her husband. Whoops, wrong person. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. The creators? No, no. That guy. Let's, let's rewind the tape. <laughs> Go again. I have a little angel perched on my shoulders that's going to help me with the name of the creators. Uh, uh, should I? Uh, I think Kara is unavailable now. <laughs> yes, say, we have say, lost soldier Say Kara. Jikanai. Say Jikanai. <laughs> Thank you, little angel. So, uh, Card Letter is a bluffing game, uh, bluffing card game, actually, uh, where the players will take turns um, trying to be the one to write a letter to the princess. So, the way that it plays is very simple. In turns, players will each draw a card and play one card. They always have one in hand, so when they draw it, they have two in hand, and they play whichever one they want. So this game has not many cards. I think it plays with le it's a deck of less than 40 cards, maybe even less than 30. Um, so there is not a huge number of cards going around the table. And so you can keep in mind which cards happened, which cards have already been seen, and then guess which cards each of your opponent has in hand. So these different cards have uh, different ways. Some are there to try to eliminate other players because an eliminated player cannot write a letter to the princess, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. Some of <laughs> some other cards are there to manipulate the deck. For instance, uh, the Chambellan might, might be, depending on translation, allows you to draw three cards and then put two of your cards back under the deck. So when you draw it, you end up with three cards in your hand. You keep whichever one you want, and you put the other two back under the deck in the order that you want, which can be very interesting when you get to the end of the game, and you know how many cards there are still in the stack, and which one you will maybe draw, and you can manipulate things that way. So you're going to take turns playing these cards, and keeping one always uh, in, in your hand and trying to understand which card each of your opponents has and using the cards to defend yourself and not get eliminated from the game and eliminate the other ones so for instance there is the princess the princess is a useless card most of the time because she doesn't have any power the only power she has is that if you discard or play her you lose you get eliminated and there are some cards that can force an opponent to discard their hand and draw a new card. But if someone has the prince that does this discarding mechanic in their hand and knows that someone here has a princess, you can play it and say, okay, I'm using the prince on you. You have to discard your card, draw a new card, and they say, oh, but I have a princess. Sorry, but you lose. And it's all going to take turns uh, like that, using the different cards to try to understand uh, what your opponents have, trying to save yourself, and score points. Every time you uh, deliver a letter to a princess, you score one point. The first player reaching five points um, played in a few rounds. And depending on the amount of player, you can end up with a very tight uh, result, like four, four, five. And th I, th I think that's very fun. Uh, I think that games that play in rounds like this, where you win a round and at the end it's a certain amount of one round that determine uh, it's the, the final winner. I, th I think it's something very interesting because you can always redeem yourself. And uh, I think that's very cool. I would say that Love Letter is a game that's, uh, well, uh, sadly that's not uh, the, a, a sentence that um, brings only good memories to me, but easy to learn, but hard to master. Because uh, the first time that you play, generally, you don't understand the full extent of the bluffing you can get. And by the time you keep on playing, you get into it. Because, for instance, once I had the princess in my hand, and I had uh, the baron, I think? Baron? Um, and the baron says... You, you pick another player, so you, you play the Baron, you put it on the table, and you keep your Princess in your hand. And the Baron says, you pick another player, you compare the strength of your card, and the one that has the stronger card wins. Because each card, they have a different number. On the uh, top left corner, which is the strength, uh, which ranks from 0 to 9, and uh, this strength uh, but mostly is there for some ties and for the power of the Baron. And um, there are two princes in the game, they have the same number, there are uh, six guards in the game, they have the same number, it's always linked to the type of card. And so when you have the baron and you have a princess, you say, oh, I'm going to win, so I play my baron. But then, when you are three, four, five players, you give an information that, yes, you played the baron, but you were very certain you would win. So if you were certain you would win, uh, there was a very high chance that you did have a princess with it in your hand, and so it's going to be very likely that one of the other players, not eliminated, will come for your princess and eliminate you. So there is that element of really learning this and yeah, trying to bluff, which is not very some, which, which is not something I'm very good at. But um, after playing more and more, I did feel that I got into it, and the fact that it's a game that plays quite fast, I think, really helped me uh, get into it and understand and see what I could do actually. So I, I think that it's one of my favorite uh, what I would call overall card games compared to for instance Citadel or Riflam. Um, I think it's one of my favorite because there is that bluffing element which I think is a bit stronger and that learning element which uh, as well I think is uh, go goes a bit deeper uh, 
than the other two. But that's my own feeling, and it can be different for uh, someone else. Well, I, yeah, it, go on. Yeah, I also really love love letter, and um, it's I find it kind of interesting. There are so many different versions of it because there's basically different themes. Um, mm. But I, um, I was going to yeah. walk through them. I will do after you finish. Okay. <laughs> but um, the, the funny thing is, um, mostly they are actually the same cards. They they just have a different theme to them, and um, but they work the same at least in the cases I encountered. Um, what should be noted is um, there is Love Letter and there is like the expansion for it. In the core game, you only have 16 cards and it's two to four players. And I like that more than with the expansion. I think with the expansion, you get to 32 cards and um, you can w play with up to eight players. Um, but yeah, I feel like- It's not been released in English, that one. Oh, okay. In Germany, there is this big box, um, basically, you core game and expansion together in one box and i f really feel like this this core game with the 16 cards is so nicely and tight tightly designed um and it plays so quick because either you are the last one with a card in your hand or someone draws the last card from the deck and then you compare the values so with 16 cards you have four players, everyone starts with one card. I think you remove one card from the deck to have like a little amount of uncertainty which cards are left. Yes. Um, so there's only, let me make a quick calculation in my head, 11 cards in the deck. So only 11 turns until the game ends. Um, and I, I, yeah, I, it's, it's quick. It's very easy to explain. I mean, draw a card, play a card. I, I, I love it. It's, it's great. Yeah, it reminds me of Coup in many ways. It sort of sits within that same design space for a game evening, you know, like waiting for people to arrive, quick game of love letter. Um, it's also, as you said, like such an absurd number of different things. So first of all, uh, there is a way to play the game um, with more players, up to eight players, uh, without having to get the expansion. Um, and you can do it with any of the versions um, because they released a... Uh, an, expansion slash accessory called big love letter and um, basically you put two decks together um, and then there's a table that walks through what numbers of each cards you should have in there to cover the various numbers of players so that's one thing and then there's of course the actual german expansion um, which doesn't seem to have been translated but it might be rolled into some of the other versions and this is the thing i love the these versions so uh, we have got um tohu bomb letter uh, Love Letter 2nd Edition, Love Letter itself, Love Letter Premium Edition, Star Wars Jabba's Palace, a Love Letter game, uh, that's last year's, uh, Love Letter Princess Princess Ever After, Love Letter Batman, Love Letter Adventure Batman. Time, Lo Lovecraft Letter, Love Letter The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies. I mean, yeah, that screams Love Letter to you, doesn't it? You know, obviously... <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, uh, um, Archer, Once You Go, Blackmail, um, Star Wars Secret Invasion, Infinity Gauntlet, a love letter game, Lost Legacy Flying Garden, Lost Legacy the Starship, uh, one that I don't, I'm not going to even try and pronounce it, but the final letter, words are Witch Hat, Xeno, and then another one, which is only foreign language um, as well. And I think that's the lot. Yes, that's it. So there's like 18 versions listed on Board Game Geek, um, which kind of says a lot about how simple the game is if it's that heavily rethemed and, and translated to other things. I'm almost sad there isn't a Princess Bride version. Um, oh, yes, there should be. Well, there will be eventually, I imagine. I mean, you know. That... Which remind me something that. Uh... The game, the graphics on the game are inclusive. Mm -hmm. The princess, the prince, they are people of color, for instance. And 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 I think that's really that's really cool to see in a game uh, this, this this inclusivity. And it should be normal uh, today. We should not be commenting on it and saying, "Oh, it's great," but we are still there and i think yes it it is super cool not yeah. in my german version 
<laughs> I think that may be a later uh, version or something. I can't remember. Like, my version is the one, a Z-Man version that came in the um, velvet bag. And because I hate, yeah, that's, that's what I, have. I hate the touch of it, I haven't played it in ages. I don't know where it is. Um, but so, yeah, I have played the um, video game version a bit, but... Yeah, uh, it does remind me. Yeah, oh god, that's right. The um, the prince looks like uh, Brad Pitt in the version I have. Yeah, in mine he looks like uh, Roger Jean Page a bit. Not familiar with them. No. But Bridgerton season one. Uh, uh, love interest. I'm not the one who watched Bridgerton in this house. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I mean, you probably have seen his face. Maybe. I, I might recognize him if you if if, if I saw him. Um, sure. Yeah. yeah. I think he looks a bit like him, but with a bit longer hair. Okay. Yeah. Better than this horrible, like, caricature of Brad Pitt. This is like like Brad Pitt if he was melted a bit. The, the, the princess looks a bit like Zendaya. Ooh, a bit. I, I I just saw the picture of the Brad Pitt prince. Yeah. <laughs> Melty Brad Pitt. It's, ast it's astounding. And, and I actually uh, recognized the prince without knowing the name of the actor in uh, uh, that mentioned Audrey. So, yeah, it's fa he's famous. Yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah, it's a simple game. So you don't need to spend more than 10 minutes talking about it, given that you can play it in under 20 minutes. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think it's time for us to... Uh, well, we've got an envelope in hand, and you've got to deliver it, so... Rather than be quick about it, we can take a long picture stroll through Japan for two. Uh, that means that it must be time for Kara with Takedo Duel. And before you take over Kara, I want to say duel is a bit of an aggressive word for this game. But it's I kept wrong. It's it... wrong. It's not duel. It's duo. I can think it's duo, but duo. it's like just you know Takedo two basically. Yes, that's the name. Anyway, it's not it duel. I don't know why, why you, you you people think it's duel. <laughs> There are a lot of duel, like Splendor duel. Now, I can tell you what happened exactly. I had Tokaido duo written down on my uh, notes for introducing this section to pull back the uh, the curtain a little bit. And then I looked at the schedule and duel was written there. And I was like, oh, it must I must have done it wrong. I, and I didn't bother looking it up. And it is Tokaido duo, which is exactly what I thought it should have been. So it's Kara with Tokaido <laughs> duo. Yeah, so... Um... We talked about Tokaido before, where you, you know, travel along the Tokaido, this uh, historic trade route in Japan. And um, Tokaido Duel is uh, a similar game. Uh, now I muted myself. That's, 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 that's nice. Um, so it's... Um, <clears throat> We talked about Tokaido, uh, Tokaido before, um, where you travel with Tokaido, um, this historic uh, trade route in uh, Japan. And Tokaido Duo is a um, version of it that's specifically for two players. The original Tokaido, um, I'm not even sure if you can play it with two players, but I don't think I would recommend playing it with two players. Um, so, um, yeah, what changed? Um, first of all, from the setting, um, it's more or less like the same regarding um, the the time when it plays, and um, it's also about traveling. But you're not traveling along the Tokaido, which is kind of weird because it's called Tokaido Duo. But uh, you travel um, on uh, Shikoku, one of the four main islands of Japan, the uh, smallest one. And um, in Tokaido, you have one character which travels and each turn you decide how far you want to go. So that's completely your decision. But if you move five spaces, you missed four spaces. Yeah? So that's the choice you have to make. In Tokaido Duo, you have three characters. You have a um, pilgrim, you have a, a trader, and you have an artist. Um, so each character, each player has these three characters. Um, and then player A starts, rolls three dice, one die for each character. Um, they have numbers on them, um, which say how far the character can go. After player A rolled the die, they pick one of these dice and move the 
character. And then the player B gets to choose one of the die, moves their character according to this die. And then player A takes the third die, moves another character. And then player B rolls the three dice again and is the first one to choose a die. So that means, first of all, you don't have freedom about how far your characters move. Um, but it's uh, dependent on what the dice rolled. And there is like a take that mechanism in, in it. So if you see, oh, um, I rolled uh, a two for the uh, pilgrim and I see my opponent would really like a two for the, their pilgrim right now. Maybe I don't really care right now. So I'll just take the two and move my pilgrim too because haha, now you can't do it. Um, that's actually so they kept the rage from the original Tokaido. <laughs> you you've got rage from playing Tokaido? Yeah, that's interesting <laughs> from because you're blocking. Yeah, <laughs> like the whole game is about blocking. If you're not okay with somebody else using the bath with the monkeys, you're playing the wrong game. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, actually, I I feel like Tokaido do in a way is Tokaido. A little more complex if you want to have more take that in it. Um, I never really felt like there's take that in Tokaido uh, because, okay, now you blocked this scenery I wanted to see, but there are two more spaces with this scenery later on, so I don't really care. Or I have other options. I, I never really felt like, ah, oh, damn, why it had, did you have to do this? Um, here it's actually different. It's actually like damn, I really needed the two for my artists so I could finally sell their paintings. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, Two players is personal, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it also because, you know, it's two players, so it's more direct. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and um, you don't have, like, this one route from beginning to end, but the monk or the, the, the pilgrim moves in a circle around the island. Um, like on, on the coastline. Um, and the uh, trader moves, um, or the merchant moves um, inside the island. There is, are um, like um, mountain villages where you can go and uh, get wares. So uh, there's one with two wares, one with three, another one with three and one with four. So if you go to one of the villages with three on it, you get three wares randomly chosen, and then um, you can move to certain coastal villages where you can sell the stuff. But um, at the beginning of the game, you dis uh, you distribute markers which tell you which coastal village buys which wares. So um, and when you are there, you can sell as many wares as you want as long as they are of the appropriate type. So um, yeah, it's like okay, move around, try to. Uh, collect wares and then move somewhere where you can sell a lot at the same time. Um, and the artist moves in between, uh, like in the areas uh, divided by the roots of the merchant. And um, they have different pictures on them. And basically, if they uh, move on a, a fitting square, they can paint another picture. And um, <clears throat> once they uh, move somewhere where there are no i'm sorry I, 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 um, <clears throat> if they move in an area where around it are three other characters they can paint the appropriate picture um, no they can paint this number of pictures and the painting on the board tells you which picture you can sell there um, yeah, it's it's actually pretty easy. It's just, you know, if you try to explain it from your mind, it's uh, like, wait, how again? How exactly was it again? You're uh, you're having a bit of a day, aren't you, Kara? <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, and that's more or less it. Each uh, character collects victory points a different way. The, um, um, the merchant by selling stuff and earning money. And so as soon as you have 10 coins, you trade them in for like a specific uh, gold coin that is worth a certain number of victory points. Um, the more you have, the more points they are worth. The um, pilgrim collects points by visiting shrines and gardens. 
and um, basically they count the shrines and gardens they visited and multiply the number um, and that's the points they collect and the artists collects points for paintings they've sold in the end and yeah as soon as one of the characters basically f collected everything they can the game ends and you uh, compare points Somehow, I, I don't remember if I was there on the Tokaido normal episode or if it's that long enough ago that I forgot about it. But to me, this, this rings a bit of a box uh, bell on some point. Not on everything, but uh, on some points. Well, the, the, the base mechanic of the original Tokaido and Parks are kind of similar in... In yeah. the way you're doing the route, so yes, maybe. And also on the selecting where to go to block your opponent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah. that just doesn't happen in Takedo though. You, you just like, except for if you're right at the back uh, on the very first turn, it's always your own fault if somebody else goes where you want to go because. You could have gone there first. You always can, like, go, I want to go there, because nobody wants to leap really far ahead. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. my problem with Hokkaido is that I played it uh, on Board Game Arena, when every, where everyone had a lot of time to plan their moves. So you basically moved, and uh, you could just uh, look three moves ahead to know that they will unavoidably block you where you wanted, uh, far away down the road. Yeah, I can see where you went wrong. You played it on Board Game Arena. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is probably the wrong game yeah, to play. It, yeah. it is. This is a game that's best played either sat down together around a table or uh, in a Discord call playing on the Takedo app, which <laughs> plays like nice chill music and cute little animations. And you don't have to worry about what's going on unless somebody got one of the really ridiculously broken characters because Takedo's, <laughs> Takedo's character balance is really out of whack. Um, I get the impression that's not the case here in Duo. Yeah, there's no, like, you don't have player powers, basically. I mean, there are, the they, there are three in the game, which you can basically collect. But uh, so there's a certain spaces when you reach it with your pilgrim, you can get one of the three player powers, basically. But if all three are taken and um, you reach one of these spaces, you can take one of the other players. So, um, yeah. Even more deck that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, you have this really nice power that lets your merchant uh, earn more money when they sell stuff. I like It'd be a that. Shame to lose it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, all in all, I have to say, which is a kind of weird thing to say, Tokaido Duo is the most owned game in my family. Um, my family owns it three times because I bought it uh, like um, before Christmas last year and took it to my parents um, over Christmas because I thought, ah, that's something I could play with my mother and she really enjoyed it. And then she played it with um, my stepfather and he really enjoyed it. So they decided to buy it as well. But since they have two houses, one in France and one in Germany, they decided, hey, it's good if we have two, ver two copies so we don't have to remember taking it with us and uh, uh, did they buy the french version for the french house no <laughs> oh too bad <laughs> but it's uh yeah it's completely language independent apart from the rule book yeah but i i like the sound of that it's not sitting there and somebody who's played a lot of games and we did play a lot of games of this being upset because they don't have either misubi uh takuru misaki or kinko who are all like so much more busted than the other characters in the game so I, I think i like that i like this the biggest problem i had was just sometimes you sit down and you look at your choice of characters and you're like oh well i, I guess i'm gonna struggle so uh, yeah i appreciate that being stripped out of there i need to learn about the boat one now yeah <laughs> The, 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 that your opponent has the ronin and you basically have the old guy with a lot of money very unfair <laughs> So yeah, for, for me, highly recommended this game. It's uh, again, a game that plays really fast, like under half an hour. Um, and it's it's fun. Uh, it's, uh, you, it's not like you do the same thing every turn. Uh, there is some strategy to it, um, but it's simple to learn. 
and um, my parents like it. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so, Cara family approved. Yes. <laughs> my my parents like it. Uh, often feels like a seal of approval on many games. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All, all I can provide is that my dad does not like Power Grid. I like Power Grid. Yeah, he doesn't care what you think about Power Grid. <laughs> <laughs> I think I like your dad. Mm, you wouldn't have enjoyed that game of Power Grid you played. I've never, ever brought it anywhere near my family since. <laughs> all right, so that's Takedo Duo 2. Uh, and so next of all, we've been to the world of Gravehold before, when Audrey talked about Eon's End. But what's it like if you spend a longer time there, a lot longer than any of these previous two games? And where is the most campaign fun to be had? So, it's me, hello, with Eon's End Legacy Campaigns. And we're going to have to start with the little disclaimer. I'm quite likely to get them tangled up at times, because the first one is called Aeon's End Legacy... And the second one is called Aeon's End Legacy of Gravehold. So I'm going to try and use like Legacy and Legacy of Gravehold or Gravehold for the second one. Or I might call them the first one and the second one. But there may be times where I just get tangled up because it's... <sighs> Maybe don't make your second game just two words different from your first one. <laughs> Add so. dig to words. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Uh, so we know how Aeon's End works. As a refresher, uh, well, first of all, you could go listen to Audrey talk about it before. Much much more comprehensive than I'm going to be here. But it's a deck builder, boss battler. You pick a breach mage. They have a set number of cards in their deck. It's in a fixed order, fixed hand. You have a number of breaches, some of which are open, some of which are closed. You play your spells to your breaches, and then you can cast them in following turns once they're prepared, as they call it. Uh, you get gems, which is economy, and you can buy more gems, or you can buy more spells, or you can buy relics that do a thing. Kill the boss before the boss kills you, or smashes the heck out of Gravehold. That's the game. It's really good. So, yes! we've played... That's Go on. No, I, I just, yes. Yes, yeah. yeah. Yes. So, uh, we played through Aeon's End Legacy a while ago. Um, and then I went back and had another look at it, and um, we just finished Legacy of Gravehold this week, and we pushed a bit to get it done before our trip to Stockholm. Uh, but uh, so, Aeon's End Legacy is a game, you'll sit down at the start of the game, you'll pick one of four different colours of Breach Mage, and you can be either uh, like male or female. Um, you choose their name, and gradually over the whole campaign, you will like evolve your signature spell or gem you will uh, pick up a ultimate ability you'll even get some additional powers all through the joyous uh, experience of sticking stickers on things and writing on cards classic legacy stuff uh, it tells the story of what happened to the first grave hold there is like an ongoing story within uh, Aeon's End um, and Legacy of Gravehold builds on that later uh, and you will just essentially follow an on-road story told through cards with a little bit of text. You'll fight bosses. If you win, one, you'll read one section of text. If you lose, you'll read another. You keep going, do -do, 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 do all the way through it until you get to the end. I'm going to try and avoid being too specific on any, like, giveaways. I'm going to try and avoid spoilers where I can. Uh, but I can say that it's this first Aeon's End Legacy was light on the narrative. But it did like foreshadow what was going to happen. You could kind of figure it out and see it coming if you were paying attention. It was reasonably well written. And honestly, the kind of level of text I want from a legacy game. Um, if you're playing solo, you can sit and read a lot of stuff. Uh, but if you're not, well, you're playing group reading. And I'm not a big fan of group reading in a board game. I... If I'm reading more than like a paragraph or somebody's reading more than the paragraph, you can be guaranteed that there's some eyes drifting off. Uh, so um, I appreciated the level. The campaign we played through did all of the bosses on standard. Um, did have to, did like lose one or two of the fights and had to do the replay, but never lost completely. All of the bosses were varied and different. And I've gone back and played some of them since and it's pretty, pretty good experience. 
uh, I very much liked what that was doing. At the end of the whole of uh, Legacy, you have you, like some of the cards you have to change with replacements that are for standalone games, but you'll have a bunch of bosses that you can play against again and again, and you'll have your own custom breach mages between one and four, depending on how many players you played with. And they're a little bit more powerful than normal breach mages, but you have the option to ignore certain abilities they have at the start to bring them back in line with everyone. It's cool. I really enjoyed it. You end up attached to your breach mage. You get to see them develop in power. Everything feels like it's scaling well enough that you have to play well, but you do not have to play perfectly. Um, and also because you're constantly playing with the same breach mage, you're refining them to the style of play that you enjoy and you're also learning the best way to utilize what you've got. So that's Legacy. Legacy of Gravehold is more. It's taking place at a point where New Gravehold and Aza have had like a falling out and there's a bunch of, of breach mages, there's a disagreement, uh, which basically boils down to conservatives versus liberals, is, is essentially what the plot is. Gravehold is all like, People who are different are terrible and bad and they should go away because they're void touch. And Aza's like, hey, people who are void touch can still contribute. We should judge them by what they're doing. It was really hard to like the grave hold people here. Really hard because, <laughs> you know, it's it, it cuts a bit close. Um, so politically, it felt a bit relevant. It's really wordy. Like really wordy. As in you're reading text in the middle of battles as well. And then you're reading like a page worth of text. Or at one point we were sat there reading three pages of text to go through everything. Um, so it's a lot. And additionally, uh, the game floods you with breach mages. You don't play one character consistently through the whole campaign. You'll start off like you decide, am I going to play as Aza or Gravehold? So we went Aza. The other bot, book, there's two books, a blue one for Razor, a brown one for Gravehold. You may as well toss it in the trash as soon as you pick which campaign you're going on, because you never touch the other book without a reset pack. Which felt a bit weird, a bit wasteful. I thought like we were going to play through the Azer campaign, and then it would go, and now, put the Azer book away, take out the Gravehold book and play through that. But no, everything from just the one book. Uh, you start with a choice of four Breach Mages, then the, you'll fight a given starting boss, who was... Not fun. Um, you have to write a lot on the cards, so it's really stop-starty. So you're like, this thing's happening, and now you need to take this card and write this on it, and then you put that card here, and now you can carry on playing normally. And it was like, really hard to get into because of so much going on. Um, then it got a bit better. Like, we actually enjoyed the Aza campaign a lot, and effectively, like, just Aza... I call it campaign, it's like an expedition, which I'll talk about near the end. Uh, and we get through it, and we had a grand time. And then it's time to switch to Grave Hold, and all the wheels fell off. Um, you have a different set of Breach Mages, you have different spells, and we, we had a, a terrible time. Like, really, really bad time. Um, it's... <sighs> I was excited because some of the decisions we'd made had like put stickers on the map and I was like, ooh, this is going to determine what's happened with the, the second set of bosses when we fight them. And what the campaign boiled down to, instead of the way Eon's End is when it's at its best, where every boss is doing something cool and unique, like the Rageborn has its own deck where it kind of smashes you, uh, or the um, there's the guy who like corrupts you with Jade and offers you those, and you need to get rid of them, but they also offer a lot of power. All of that kind of stuff... Well, no, the Gravehold campaign basically went one interesting boss fight at the beginning, um, who, like, uh, not really a spoiler to talk about, because it is sort of one of the first bosses you can face if you pick Gravehold. Essentially, there's a mechanic where it goes, you can have stuff from the market, but it's going to cost you freebies for that. That was cool. And then every single other fight was minion spam, minion spam, minion spam, and minion spam. And some of these minions had 10, 14 hit points. Um... And we got, like, we double lost quite a few of those fights. And we got all the way to the final boss, and the first playthrough of it, the boss just dropped every single one of its minions out on the board in two turns, and then went, I win. And we were like, have we done this wrong? So 
um, I went and had a read, and no, no, like the vast majority of people are saying the Gravehold campaign is really hard to do well in. The spells are a bit underwhelming. There are a couple of good breach mages, but not a lot of them, and it's kind of miserable. And so my first recommendation would be, if you're going to play it, play the Grave Hold section of the campaign first, because that way you can get the less fun stuff out of the way, because the Aza stuff is great. Uh, yeah, so um, effectively the campaign is two expeditions, which is like this um, uh, mini campaign thing that they came up for, uh, came up with for the New Age and Outcasts. I've played the Outcasts one. Um and it has the same writing problems that all of Aeon's End has, which is it's not like super well written, um, but it's serviceable. Except that Legacy of Gravehold has just so much of it. And the characters are just like they all start off friends and then within like one scenario, they're yelling at each other and getting into all sorts of like overdramatic nonsense. Uh, and then suddenly you get a lot, you know, it's just the characters felt really inconsistent. Um, and on top of that, mechanically, there's this thing called severing, which is sometimes a breach mage can get hit by a card and it says if this card exhausts them, they become severed. And being severed means that they can't reach their breach magic anymore, which means they're effectively dead for the campaign. Not physically dead, but you can't use them again. So we had these situations where you're just starting to get grips with the character. You're like, oh, I quite like how this Breach Mage plays. And then a card is flipped off of the Nemesis deck and it goes, if you're exhausted, uh, get severed. And it's like, oh, okay. So, I mean, in the Gravehold campaign, I lost every single Breach Mage I was excited by playing, including in scenarios we won. I still had to pick a new Breach Mage afterwards, which really sucked. Um... And uh, yeah, it was it was so such a slog to get through. We had to sort of put it down near the final battle, um, and then pick it up again. Uh, so, as a legacy campaign, Legacy of Gravehold is really lacking. Uh, it is not fun. There's a couple of bosses that are so unbelievably hard that I can't even figure out how you take them on in normal 1v1 mode, even with the toned down stuff. Um, a couple of them have no upper limits, how much health they can have, and they just heal like crazy. Uh, and and just putting lots of minions on the board is an interesting mechanic, and it can be done well. It was done well in the first Legacy of uh, first legacy campaign. There's a really co couple of really cool minion-based bosses that we were like, that's sweet. This one, we hated them. And I've spent like an hour beforehand just reading through the legacy of gravehold forums and i've seen that a lot of people are either agreeing yet they're really difficult or they are not fun at all um and so i don't know uh, i i think you can see where my judgment is going on this in regards to how i feel about them both um mm. legacy of gravehold is like you've got no time to bond to a particular character uh, it is basically would have been better as being two separate boxes uh, containing an expedition for each uh, the legacy mechanics do not feel interesting or engaging. Um, there's a lot of frustration and uh, the, 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 the end of it like, is just not great. The, the final antagonist of Legacy of Gravehold is like a bit kind of out of nowhere. You sort of know who's coming, but then you don't know who they really are. And then when you find out, you're like, well... I knew who the character was and my partner was like, I don't know who that is. I've got no idea. And I was like, I only know because I played the original Aeon's End with that character. Um, so, yeah. and everybody else, even in even in plot, one of the characters is like, I had no idea, you just disappeared. And it's sort of, yeah, it's, it's, it's sloppy. So, um, I think Aeon's End Legacy, the first one, is a better done game. And I like the fact that at the end of it, you've got a nice standalone breach mage that you can come back to occasionally be like oh yeah i remember playing this character i made this character from a bunch of bolted on options but still uh and legacy of gravehold is just not good enough for the price um i would recommend if you want a campaign mode you should actually look at either getting the new age or outcasts both of which are a lot cheaper and they have an expedition mode you play through it the first time, you play a story, and it like unlocks on the way. Uh, so Legacy Light, 
And then at the end of it, you've got a recursive expedition gameplay style with random breach mages, with random markets and random bosses that gradually get harder and harder. That's fantastic. And that's my like ultimate recommendation. Uh, but yeah, so I would say get New Age or Outcasts, then maybe get Aeon's End Legacy. And then at the end of it, if you really want some more content, Legacy of Graveholds there, but you need to be a really competent and good Aeon's End player to do well in that. And you need to be able to identify how to win very quickly in every fight. Um, uh, and you often you'll still only manage maybe to squeak a win on the second fight. In respect to what both games are like when you're finished, uh, they're pretty fantastic. The amount of extra content you get is great. There's loads of it. You can integrate it with all the existing Aeon's End stuff really well. Um, but like the all the legacy elements, they're kind of thrown out the window. You, you don't really use them except for your legacy breach mages from the first one. So all of these changes you're making through Legacy of Gravehold mean bunkers. So that's where I land with it. Um, uh, you know, it's taken like a year for me to get to this point. We've managed to play through both of them. And I'm, I've just got to give them two thumbs down, really. Like, for the diehard fans. Yeah, so, any questions? Not, not, not really, not, 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 sorry, not, not really I'm having a hard time with my eyes. I would have things to say, but I'm, no, I'm sadly in cons. Uh, yeah. I'll probably reference your, your intervention while I talk about Astronites. That's fair enough, yeah. For the most part, I just wanted to be like, I've played them, I'm exhausted. ALZ Legacy, I have fond memories of. Legacy of Gravehold, I have fond memories of the first half of it. And the second half was so awful, I wish I hadn't played it. So, that's Aeon's End. It's a really good game, just not in that particular box. <laughs> so... What Fine. kind of? I will remember. Mm -hmm. I will remember that when Legacy of Gravehold comes out in French in two years. Yeah, <laughs> unless they're revising things, I would probably skip on it. Uh, yeah. So what, what kind of interested me is uh, like campaign length. How how do they compare there? Um, Aeon's End Legacy uh, is a bit shorter. Um, it's about say one and a half times the length uh, of sorry uh it's it's say if legacy of gravehold is two expeditions length and a final battle um aeon's end legacy is like one and a half expeditions so it's about 60 percent of the length to play through uh but um it's actually one that i bought the reset pack for and when some friends visit we're probably going to play through it again with four breach mages uh, because I enjoyed the actual mechanical playing of all of it, even when it was hard, a great mm. deal. Okay. Yeah. So, finally, we're going to get on our Astro Rocket to the Astro Moon, where there's an Astro Castle with Astro Grounds, and on the Astro Turf stand, Astro Knights with Astro Alessio. Okay, <laughs> let's see. Uh, we, are, we will be talking about Astro Knights, and I'll do a preface too. Uh, probably I get a lot of terms wrong, because uh, after an intervention about Eon's End, I will uh, reference Eon's End, term, Eon's End terms in Astro Knights and vice versa, so hopefully uh, this will be uh, understandable at the end. So, let's see. Uh, Astro Knights is... Uh, 2023 games let's say from Nick Little and Will Sobel so the same couple from uh, Eon Sand and uh, it's basically uh, it can be defined as sci-fi Eon's End uh, which means that the main the, the main part of the game is still there you are uh, astronauts with the star cores on their uh, on their breasts and uh, they are uh, you are fighting uh, bosses which are basically nemesis which are in turn basically incarnation of sci-fi tropes in the in the original box there are four and you get a fifth from the kickstarter campaign i the fish on parasite i didn't play it so i won't review it and uh, uh, the mechanic is that you have a lot of weapons which work like spells in uh, Eon Sand. You uh, fire them 
you, you equip and fight them through your slots, which are basically rifts uh, in Eon's End, and uh, you play through this heavily cooperative deck building, uh, which works exactly the same, which means that the main gimmick is the same. You buy cards, you put them in the discard pile in a certain order, and when your deck is done, instead of shuffling it, you just flip it and play it again in that same order. This is uh, uh, the genius part of both games for me, so uh, this main mechanic uh, has stayed the same. Now, uh, what is Astronite? Uh, Fan talked about uh, talk about the fact that uh, Eons and Legacy as a, is a campaign is made for a campaign. Uh, Eons and has a lot of boxes with a lot of Nemesis monsters and so on. Uh, Astronite is uh, a review of Eons and revised to be as fast as simple and quick to play as possible with a single instance of fights. Uh, I don't think it's a big of a stretch if you think about uh, Astronites, uh, it's like uh, comparing uh, uh, one boss fight of Marvel Champions to a campaign of Arkham Horror LCG. You can see that a bit of the part of the core of the mechanics which advance uh, the, the story are the same, but uh, uh, one is focused to a campaign and the other is focused on a single funny boss fight. So uh, this is basically the same because Astronaut is a very uh, is a pretty great experience for one of fights. I love it for that. Uh, personally, I think uh, it feels exactly the exact spot I wanted for a boss fight game with cards. Uh, I like a lot Eon Send, I, but I didn't manage to get all the boxes that were required to play Eon Send satisfactorily, especially since I, I'm a, co a bit of a completionist myself. So, uh, I mean, Gastronites, which is an even slightly smaller box than Eon Sand filled to the brim with this kind of content is beautiful. Now, uh, to give you an idea of the quality of life improvements that were put into uh, Astronites, you can think, uh, for instance, there's the fact that the bosses have no common deck. There's no basic deck here. So every boss has their own set of cards and is very unique and it helps a lot because the bosses uh, which are the strong suit of Eon Sand and Astronites are character characterized uniquely. I have experience only with the base box of Eon Sand but I can tell that uh, both Furion, Continua and, and so on uh, are all more complex than Eon Sand the their Eon Sand counterparts. After that, uh, there is one groundbreaking, uh, well, groundbreaking innovation which was put into uh, Astronites, which is uh, there are texts you can buy from the market. Uh, these texts uh, work basically like artifacts in Eon Sand. Uh, in uh, Astronites, you can overcharge a tech meaning that you pay the cost to buy it, but you play it from the market and you discard it there without adding it to your deck. So you get a one-time boost without clogging your deck. And that opens up a lot uh, to a lot of strategies, especially considering that uh, uh, you basically flip your deck. So it's uh, a lot more interesting what you can do. Uh, also, all the same as a quality of life improvement, uh, it has been brought uh, the fact that uh, uh, you can discard the cards uh, in your end, in any order you like, before drawing other cards. So basically all the game flows simpler and faster. All of this to say, uh, basically Astronite is a kind of a simplified version for one of battles of Eon's End with a sci-fi setting. Uh, I like it a lot. Uh, that's exactly what I wanted from a game. It's uh, 
I think in length is about the same uh, as a game of Eon Sand. I played only solo, through solo and two ended and with two players. And basically all games were always about one hour, a bit less than one hour. So uh, I think that uh, it's the same duration as uh, a game of Eon Sand. But uh, I found exactly what I wanted in Astronites and I like it. It's simpler, it flows faster, it's one of games and it's fully expandable. I, I liked it a lot. So basically that's it. I, I think that uh, my, my, my real impression of this game is that uh, there's a lot to discover but the game is very contained so you can have a, the entire box of it for 35 euros or something and play a lot of games with it and uh, be left after that wanting for more. I played 11 games so far, so not a lot. I feel there's a lot uh, to discover. I basically played to have a clear idea. I played Zack and Christina, which are the astronauts you are suggested to start playing with. But I actually, I love a lot Gabriel, which uh, opens up to a lot of interesting mechanics. So, uh, so that, that's a lot to discover for me, and the game has, has not been exhausted. Uh, one thing I should say about this is that the game will probably need, eventually, uh, more expansions. It's clear that it's, it has been designed to be expanded uh, in uh, subsequent boxes, exactly like Eon Send, because you have 9 or 10 of each uh, card in the market, so you, you will probably be found wanting for more once you have explored all that's in the basic box. And that's basically it, I guess. I won't explain the entire game here, so <laughs> that's what I think about uh, Astronites. A very, very fun game for one of games. Yeah. I really like what you described about overcharging the... Yeah text uh yeah that that does sound like very useful because in eons and like you, you get these in, in generally you get some of them that are for the um, completely destroying cards from your game and sometimes they have a or do that but sometimes they don't have a or do that and when you end up at that spot you are like eh, dead card and that does feel like yeah much more meaningful and also you have more control over when you use it uh, I, I really like this uh, this idea. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the part I like more. Oh, there's also another thing which adds a lot of longevity to Astronax actually. Uh, in uh, Eon Sand you are protected Greyhold and that's it. It's always Greyhold. In uh, Astronites you are protecting your homeworld. You have four or six of them and you will have more with expansions. So uh, it actually uh, adds a lot to the to the differences in playing the same boss. The homeworlds give some kind of small powers. Or yeah, they have a lot of different powers and starting a, starting at max HP and power levels and stuff like that. Uh, Ooh. So there's a lot of variance in four bosses basically and six astronauts and uh, your homeworlds. Uh, there are actually five bosses because there's fish on parasite but again i didn't play it yeah here we go i'd like to pitch a uh a new version of that game caused by my slightly inferior hearing damaged slightly <laughs> gastro knights from the onion planet <laughs> gastro knights <laughs> Yeah, a food-themed version of this game entirely food themed you can pitch it at a younger yeah. audience well, that, that one would be very poorly translated in French because gastro generally means intestine disease. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does, but also yeah. gastro is a type of food. I have to say, I I mean, just looking at the pictures, I like the, the character boards. Yeah, uh, the, the quality is, I think, the same as Eon Send. I cannot be sure because I don't own fi physically Eon Send. I only have the Steam app. 
but uh, uh, you have uh, the the bosses organized in tech boxes uh, you have the uh, the the monster shape the boss boards uh, the only one thing i i'd like to say about this is that i like the artwork in astronauts way more it makes oh, yeah. a lot it looks a lot like a 90s cartoon and i like it yeah, it's a bit strange to think this is artwork from the same studio that does the Eon's End stuff. It's Gong Studios for both. And they're so inconsistent in yeah, Eon's End. Yeah. Like, like they, they, they draw yeah. one character and then within the... You know, it happened when we were playing Gravehold. One of the characters, we had the artwork for him on his card. And then he appeared on another card. And I didn't realise they were the same character at first. And we ended up stopping for like 10 minutes discussing like, what the heck is going on? And... Sometimes the characters are so deformed looking as well, like really <laughs> odd. Uh, I don't see any of that here. These are very um, clear and uh, I, I, I like their designs. Uh, apart from Alexios, who, I don't know, he looks like he's stolen someone's sweets or he's lurking on a corner waiting for someone to <laughs> harass. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> anyway, the... Uh, I know that uh, uh, artwork in Astronauts has actually been criticized a bit because it it is a bit stereotyped. Maybe it maybe it follows a bit of sci-fi tropes, but I like it. Also, Zack looks a lot like looks a lot like Zero in uh, Borderlands Two, so that's great. <laughs> that's a bonus point. Yeah, I mean, that's what, a point. I, I mean, what I don't like about the art is the, the the game board because I, I mean looking at the picture of the setup game with the, the sport there it it's just so busy and i oh my god <laughs> um that, that's too much for me uh but i guess i mean the board just tells you where to put which card so i guess you can play it without the board so I think there's, yeah, I think there's a math because I don't have a playing board. I have just the boss board, your characters board, and then the cards in the market. So, yeah, probably that's it. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's the Kickstarter bonus, Matt. And you're right, it is way too busy. If they were going to put this much on it, they needed to desaturate the whole thing significantly. Or they just needed to put less on there. Yeah, yeah de definitely. The, the, the good part about this, anyway, is that for 35 euros, you have a complete game and you can basically play it until you are satisfied. And it will always be entertaining, cool one of battles like the original Aeon Sand, actually. I have a very serious question. Um, so the are these normal tuck boxes for the bosses are they like the usual tuck boss boxes we get with board games uh they are normal tuck boxes i guess okay you yeah that that's not a benefit then that's all i need to know i hate those tuck boxes so much <laughs> they, they, what is it with the design that where you know like the they kind of get the lid gets caught underneath the two flaps on the side and you fight with it <laughs> you're I like oh my this. god I i'm gonna rip this, this. <laughs> yeah. They are like those, yeah. There's one here that the, yeah, I, I, the, the I, 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 final I, I, girl I box comes in. Why, why not just have like, like a tuck box, but just still open on one end and have a compartment on the inside, you store it in and then it doesn't come out and it's not a mess and you have a little uh, half circle cut out so you can grab the card in it. Done! Yeah. Whoever came up with the idea of you, they have those little slits on either side of the flap and then, so the two internal flaps create that lock. And then you're like, oh God, I'm going to have to bend this. Uh, there we go, finally opened. And that's because I don't even care about it, this box. Um, but uh, uh, no, no, no. There we are, a little bonus rant for listeners about one of the worst <laughs> things you... Yeah, if you're going to design a board game, don't do tuck boxes like this and have an index. <laughs> okay. Uh, Astronauts isn't out. Plus one yeah. for the index. Uh, yeah, Astronauts isn't out here yet in Sweden, or at least not in the shops I um, go to. So I can't comment on it uh, apart from what I've visually seen. Uh, I do feel like the player boards are gonna wear and tear quite hard over time. It th that's a cut out hole, isn't it, where you put like um, things like a tracker. 
Oh, the, the, the trackers are, uh, are uh, basically carved into the boxes. They are not dual layered. There's only one layer with. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but they, 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 no, they work fine. <laughs> they work fine. Don't, don't, don't harm them. No, I, I'm sorry, but but the table is not the second layer of your dual layer board. Mm. <laughs> that's why. That's why they try. They, they try to sell you a mat. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate the price point on it, but uh, though in yeah. Germany, I, I mean, I've I've looked and in 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 the German online shops I frequent, it's for fifty euros. So, oh, I got it for thirty five. I, I I think I also bought it. Uh, yeah, from Zatu. So it's like thirty five euros after change. Yeah, it was pre order. So. I had to put taxes in it, but it was basically because I was importing from UK. Huh. Well, it's nice you're supporting a third world economy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they need it. Uh, anyway, uh, there's also upcoming a new Kickstarter with the second box set where you will get reprints because uh, uh, that's uh, basically their business model. And uh, uh, I think that for this year, actually, I am looking forward to these uh, other Astronauts uh, Kickstarter and uh, Mindbug new crowdfunding. Mm, well, um, yeah, I look forward to you talking about it. I'm, yeah. I, I won't be backing. I am making a deliberate, uh, and I'm not backing Kickstarters if I can avoid it at all these days now. But. Uh, I will probably give this a look again if it turns up in my local game stores because mechanically I think it's going to be very enjoyable. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the, the, I cannot stress enough that the best part about it is that you can play one and done and be happy about what you played. Cool. Okay, so that was Astro Knights. And with that final round of Astro Gold, uh, that's all the time we have for board games in this episode. You can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash the last standee, or one word, or as the last standee on Twitter. Uh, if we're still ever using Twitter, I'm not. Um, uh, nope. we, are not I never have. we are not updating it a lot, but yeah. we are still there for the moment. Yeah, it's still there to enjoy the train wreck. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we can also listen to us on whatever preferred podcast app you like best. Until next time, we have been at the last standee, so it's goodbye from Astralesio. Goodbye. Audrey. Bye-bye. Cara. Ciao. And myself. And remember that the second E in standee is for Europa.